I'm very proud of the fact that I finally m am managing to learn how to deal with my interaction on s um, Stack Exchange. I stay away from the physics department because I don't belong there. My questions only pertain to electrodynamics, so I stay in the electrical engineering area. And um, I don't entirely give up. I give up maybe for a little bit while a until I realize, no, I can approach this from a different angle. And then I take, see what happened was, I've already asked like, I don't know, this is like my fourth time that I'm asking basically the same question. Um, I reword it, and this time I, I had to borrow the text from the prior edition because I wasn't given a chance to um, edit my question. It was deleted before I could edit it, before I could respond to the guy. Well, I did respond, but it was immediately deleted. So, But then I thought of things afterwards. That was it. I came upon a link that helped to find something, and so I thought I would, you know, argue. But then I realized, no, I don't need to argue. I simply need to eliminate everything he said as being useless and only retain what's useful. And he, there were two things, I think, that I found useful from his perspective. The guy who was complaining, he edited my uh, question. He didn't answer. You know, nobody answered my question. Nobody's answered anything yet. Um, and since it's on hold, as you see, nobody can at the moment. But um, I've managed to get a negative 6 volt <laughs> downvote, and I'm still not deleted. Um, it's been less than 24 hours since I asked this question. And every time I change the title, um, that changes the URL up here. And then I go over to archive.org and request um, this page to be saved so that I have a saved copy there on archive.org. But I also, if you go to my website, vinyasi.info, and scroll down after the Quora section where I put Quora questions, I embed them in my page, then comes the Stack Exchange, because I obviously like Quora better than Stack Exchange, because it's easier. You don't have to earn the right to do anything on Quora. You just do it. And, you don't, and because you don't earn the right, you don't get to do too much either. So you don't get to obliterate somebody's uh, question just because you don't like it, um, <laughs> which they, they have too much power. They're power hungry over there at Stack Exchange. Anyway, so I have a couple of links and the last one. Yeah, four attempts. So this is the fourth attempt. And so I save it on my website as well as on archive.org. So... Um, uh, my domain for that, whoops, oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I just connected uh, my connection to the internet in order to uh, make this recording. So now I don't get Quora back. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> well, it's there. So you go to vinyasi.info and you can see a copy I in case it should get deleted or you can go to archive.org um, to get the earlier uh, diction. But my the latest is always on my website because the one on archive.org was before I made all these changes. I made some severe changes. So I changed the, 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 uh, the topic to, I, I, I was very coy, <laughs> not how or how can, but may oscillations approximate an infinite quality factor. So I was trying to do what I normally do is bait the hook, so to speak, you know, try to be coy. Um, I'd like to know how, but to do that, oh, see, all they've done is find fault. The, nobody's answered, the, and they claim, they claim, put on hold as unclear what you're a asking. Please clarify your specific problem or add additional details to highlight exactly what you need. As it's currently written, it's hard to tell exactly what you're asking. See the How to Ask page for help to clarify this question. You know, that's a canned response, but whoever has the merit, the badges requisite to delete pages, or excuse me, delete, um, yeah, pages, delete questions, um, I get to still see them when I log in, but you don't see them. Well, uh, whoever, whoever, whoever is in charge of that area has um, either been too busy elsewhere or just doesn't want to be bothered. 
because I've never seen it get this low before, negative six down votes, and still be not deleted. But I am getting good. I'm getting better at re-asking the questions. So I included two things that T.S. from the prior, the third <laughs> attempt, had uh, left behind in his wake. One was infinite quality factor, and another was losslessness. Now, they're both equivalent terms. They're synonymous terms, as far as I can tell. Um, infinite quality factor implies all gain without loss, but I use the word approximate because I wish to convey or imply the mathematical uh, um, idealism of what I'm asking, because these, these are simulations. They're all mathematical. I, I'm, not I'm not showing uh, oscilloscope tracings of a real-world experiment that I'd like to understand why I'm getting over unity. It's merely a simulation experiment that achieves over unity in microcap of all things, a variety of Berkeley spice. So I take it seriously what I'm able to accomplish in microcap that I could much more readily accomplish in Paul Falstead's simulator too readily to be believable in the real world. But I must say Paul Falstead's simulator was great for me to get a start because I knew absolutely zip when it comes to electrodynamics so he made his simulator made it easy for me to produce over unity starting with the use uh, applying the use of Eric Dollard's LMD module his analog computer in longitudinal magnetodielectric mode i've always felt in my heart that somehow that would hold a key to understanding how to apply over unity to an electric car so as to eliminate the elect our electric car's dependency on batteries very heavy dependency on batteries. That's a, that's a weakness. That's a big, glaring weakness. It's so obvious. Anywho, but it took me a few years to get to the point where I could challenge myself with microcap, the most difficult of, of the various simulators I've ever tried, that does not stand in your way. Unlike there is one simulator on the Internet called um, Every Circuit, I think it's called. Every, every circuit, something like that. Um, and they, along with <laughs> the more recent edition of Paul Falstead Simulator, not the one I downloaded a few years ago, uh, both of those have uh, policies written into their software to prevent over unity. And so that is against thermodynamics. Thermodynamics allows for overunity. It's called surges, transients, whatever you want to call it, over electrical overloads, all kinds of words in both English and Spanish I can think of. Um, in, in you know Spanish, they don't have a word transient, but they have electrical overload. So fine, whatever it's called, it exists. Electrodynamic theory allows for overunity. And this is what I try to confront people with that the simulator is a robot and it's merely it merely does what it's told to do it cannot do anything else and if it doesn't have any policy written into it to undermine its electrodynamic theory which is takes up most of its software code then it you can find ways of creating over unity parametric excitation is an easy one you know just changing the value of a resistor or a capacitor while Paul Falstead's simulator is running, the older version, um, it will actually either make energy disappear or make it appear, depending on where within the AC cycle you make the change. I learned through practice, you make the change just as the sine wave is turning direction. Either it's just passing its peak it already passed its peak and it's just beginning to come down or it passed its trough and it's beginning to come up. When it's on the slide of movement, beginning its slide and nowhere else, that's the, the greatest likelihood, statistical likelihood, that you will achieve a synthesis of electricity as opposed to its decomposition. And because I don't always have that advantage, I learned how to create a statistical probability of creating synthesis condition rather than decomposition condition most of the time if you just randomly 
you know, vary a component and you don't pay attention to where within the AC cycle you do the variation. But be that as it may, those are all techniques I, I have applied and learned, and now I'm using the shorted motor concept that I learned from studying my simulations of Joseph Newman. His device is a shorted motor. You just wouldn't know it looking at it, but by simulating it and having a, a year to think about it, I realized it's a shorted motor. And Byron Brewbreaker had some cool stuff to say about shorted motors. They pin around for a while. And Jim Murray, in his presentation in 2016, he talks about it's intrinsic to a motor or a generator when lightly loaded that it can go into overunity and burn itself up, but only when it's lightly loaded. But it's common sense among people who deal with motors and generators, especially when they're shorted, apparently. I, I don't know all the details, but he said it's, it's nothing to get hooey about because if you try to apply a real load, or let alone or a varying load, that overunity condition disappears. So I don't know if my current simulation is actually useful because I have not been able to do a mechanical load test because I, all I do is simulations. But an electrical test is worthless because it changes the circuit. This was the mistake that Joseph Newman had to deal with when he took his um, table model to the U.S. Patent Office for testing and they changed the circuit and they admit it on their website. I link all this in my book. Um, you can download it from um, scribedig.com. Um, extending the range of electric vehicles by maximizing their amp hours. Um, you can, uh, that's a PDF copy, or you can buy it on Amazon or on Payhip. Um, anywho, um, so what I've, what I've learned is if you change the circuit, you can, huh, you lose your overunity. So that's the wrong way to test. And Jim Murray never did that when he tested his devices. He always did a mechanical load test. He never did an electrical test because that means changing the circuit. Why would you want to do that? <laughs> and then call it the inventor's circuit. It, uh, it's not his circuit anymore. Now it's your circuit. You're testing your own circuit. So it's one thing I can't do is test my circuit. And the guy who complained yesterday, TS, I think, his acronym, he put his signature when he complained, he alluded to that um, because he said it's just a lossless circuit of no real significance because it's not producing any real energy because it's not being tested. It's not being loaded. It's an unloaded circuit. He was implying that. And there's nothing I can do about that, so I don't even address that complaint. Um, there's no point. I have nothing to offer. So why, you know, whine that I'm imperfect? I just want to know why the oscillations can approximate an infinite quality factor, why the power can increase. And I guess what I'm doing, in a sense, is I'm asking for the mechanics behind a lightly loaded, shorted motor or generator that Jim Murray had mentioned in his presentation. Why does it do that? You know, not just, oh, it's common knowledge it does that, but why? And I'm not satisfied that I know why. I, I mean, in a sense, I've already given away the answer by putting it in the title. So in a sense, I haven't asked anything. It's almost a rhetorical question. But that's because I didn't say how. I just said may. I did not say why. Because if I come on too strong, I'm afraid these guys just can't handle what I'm offering them anyway, you know. And I haven't been able to answer. They have not been able to answer my question anyway. So... If I end up having to uh, eventually answer it myself, so be it. And that's what it looks like is taking place. Each time they make their criticisms, it just gives me more food for thought. And then I stumble al along and bump into uh, various other questions that are similar on either Stack Exchange or Quora to help me better rephrase my question and also better understand what I'm asking and also come closer to an answer. So I'm coming so close that I'm practically answering myself already. But anyway, be that as it may. So I'll just read you what I've said here. May oscillations approximate an, an infinite quality factor. On hold, which means that nobody gets to answer. I have to rewrite the question. But meanwhile, it's being downvoted to negative six volts. Uh, six volts. <laughs> yeah, right, six volts. Anyway, and viewed 73 times. Anyway, 
A lossless sector occurs on the left side of the schematics posted below. So what is the left side? It's this side. It's the power generating side. It's lossless. But on the right side, I partially rectify it with the help of these, this full bridge rectifier such that, um, if I go back to the question, oh shit, I lost it? I can't go back now. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, now I have to go get my stored copy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, let's see, where are we here? Is it here? No, it's not here. Where did I put it? Here it is. And here it go. Now, okay, now I gotta s increase the size so I can see without my glasses. And get rid of this garbage. There. Okay, so the lossless condition is on the left side, and on the right side, I'm partially rectifying that lossless condition, which is 180 degrees phase separation between voltage and current. There's so many different ways of describing what is going on on the left side. Um, but on the right side, I'm rectifying it to correct its negative unity power factor to make it positive unity power factor in the area of the starter coils. So I want the starter coils, um, which are here, these three magenta coils on the inner ring. See, I've got th several different sets of coils on the rotor, on the squirrel cage rotor. I've got the, the rotor itself, and then I have a parallel coil adjacent to the uh, squirrel cage rotor coil, or cage, um, creating a 99% um, armature or 99% mutual, mutual coupling coefficient relationship between them so that I can transfer energy from the left-hand side of the equation, which or <laughs> left -side hand, left hand side of the circuit, which is a lossless, to the right-hand side, which I'm partially rectifying. Um, because I want these starter coils to be as close to normal positive unity power factor as possible so that they can be the tipping point, so to speak, to um, make it possible for the rotor to spin. Because in a negative unity power factor, there's no way <laughs> you're going to get a motor to, ru to spin. But if the starter coil, there are two things I do. The starter coils uh, tip the balance slightly because um, the, um, see this is my copy, so I, I get to, uh, <laughs> my copy on my home computer that I also put on, you know, Vinyasi Dynamics, so I get to see this even though I have no connection to the internet. Woo -hoo! So I partially rectify the starter coils. And this is just one of those starter coils. And the blue is the current, and the red is the voltage. And you see the blue, the, the, vol the current is flatlined. And that's the important part. It's dominating the situation. And I figured out that that needs to be the case, and also how to do it by reducing the, the self-induction, the size the value, the parameter of the self-induction of the starter coils to be the same as the current coils, namely 100 nanohenries. You know, this is all simulation, so I can do whatever I like. So I make this, the current coils over here, what used to be the starter coils on a, an induction motor, I now make them the current coils, and they're 100 nanohenries, and the starter, the, now the new starter coils are that are rectified are 100 nanohenry. So it turns out I had to do the same thing. I just make new starter coils to have them rectified, but the same self-inductive value. Wouldn't you know it? Trial and error, I had to find out that that's the case. Because otherwise, everything is 180 degrees out of phase. Although when you look at it, you know, that's a close-up shot. But when you look at it a little further away, you get these surges that happen in a periodic manner, but they're compact uh, frequency at a high, I think it's 200,000 cycles per second, even though I'm feeding the circuit 50 cycles or 50,000 cycles per second, which turns into noise the minute it comes into the circuit, the current portion of the little sine wave generator, the voltage of course being a sine wave, but the current turns into noise, but in the circuit it turns into this losslessness, this losslessness condition, 
um, and then I have to rewire it here so that the current coils are inverted in contradistinction to the voltage coils. So the voltage coils of 100 Henry's, which are the main motor coils, they um, are coiled one way, let's say, um, uh, what do I have it here on this diagram? Uh, the voltage coils, are I have them as clockwise. That means both the current coils and the starter coils both have to be counterclockwise. They have to be lined up because they're both going to have current dominating in them, so they have to be aligned with each other. Um, but opposite wiring to the voltage. Now, normally, if you did that, you would cancel and have zero watts. But when you have this condition, you already have zero watts. So <laughs> you, you're going to want to redo your wiring to get back a non-zero watt, a, a, a positive unity power factor situation. It, it proved to be such a simple solution. I had no idea. It was just sitting there waiting for me to discover it for the last half year because I've been playing with this circuit, this shorted motors concept, for about a little over half a year now. So, <laughs> you know, some of us can be slow. Um, and this is a close-up of the um, gap and it's to signify how um, unimportant the voltage is in the starter coil because except for the dip and the rise of each gap are a little on the severe side. I think the rise goes as high as 250 volts and the dip goes as low as roughly 450 negative volts. But when it goes back to its quiescent midline status, it hovers around 1.3 millivolts. So I don't have to worry about the starter coil, you know, the, this, the gap within the starter coil. The only thing I have to worry about is the current. And this gap in the current occurs um, roughly between 39.81 milliseconds and well, something less than 31.82. So that means it's less than 10 microseconds, which is pretty good. You know, anything in the vicinity of one microsecond is really good, and less than 10 microseconds has got to be still pretty good. A little bit of a hiccup for a motor to have to deal with, but nothing more to worry about. So the gaps that I have represented by here, the drop in current, and here the uh, rise and drop in voltage. E even though they're severe, there's such a short duration. I don't, I don't worry about it. You know, so who cares? Who cares, right? Um, so I give them all the information necessary to build the damn thing. <laughs> um, you know, schema uh, conceptually. You know, nothing. You know, like what? You know, anything more detailed uh, than that. Um, and I think I've said everything I basically said. Um, oh, I learned in my prior attempt to pose this question. I, I, I'm not sharing the, the uh, schematics because I don't think it's too important. I just say, I, I treat it with one sentence. I say, these sine waves are approximated as triangular waves because the simulator is attempting to catch up with the constantly increasing frequency. And I have, uh, I'll show you, see, instead of just talking about it. I'll show you if I can figure out where I put them. Um, that's the noise schematic. Oh, here we go. But this one's a weird one. Let's see if I can do this. All right. Let's see if I zoom in. Woo, a little too much. Okay. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, I can use my mouse. <laughs> wait a minute. Oh, okay. But I got to go up. How do I go up? Oh, I got to pull the thing. <laughs> okay, we got to go all the way to the top. Okay. So y you see the, a sine wave, and it loses its nice smooth curvature because it's starting to increase its frequency before it even finishes one cycle. 
That's how fast this thing is changing its, vi its vibratory rate. And as I zoom out, we, we see it becomes more and more apparent how much this thing is speeding up. Here at 10 microseconds, it's, it's, you still have, here's the sine waves, but they're now they're turning into triangular waves, but it's still, it speeds up. And now it's sped up so much because we've backed away so much that all we get to see is Gabriel's Trumpet. That's a very interesting article on Wikipedia called Gabriel's Trumpet. It's a mathematical um, modeling of infinity, of an infinite surge, a surge that grows to infinite gain. It's mathematically modeled in such a way that the surface of the graph has very interesting properties with regard to the interior. You gotta go read it, it's fascinating stuff. It, it's along the same lines as infinite mirrors, when you have mirrors on opposite sides of a room and you stand in the middle and you see yourself echoed, echoing to inf infinite echo, infinite repetition of echo. Um, that's all part of this infinite surge um, dilemma or anomaly <laughs> or something you w choose to ignore, as the case may be, um, or in my case, I encourage it <laughs> to try to get something useful out of it. They're all uh, wrapped up. It's the same topic. It's very fascinating when you get into that, but it still doesn't explain anything <laughs> in terms of electrodynamic theory. Um, it's great. Uh, see, there's a little bit more. And then this is um, what happens if I take um, if I don't have the right conditions in the, in the um, simulator, then it breaks. And this breakdown has nothing to do with me taking advantage of it. The breakdown actually gets in my way uh, to prevent me from going any further. So that's about everything I wanted to mention about this that I posted. And what's fascinating is that it's still there for you to see. It's been viewed 74 times. Um, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> um, uh, who knows, maybe it'll be forgotten because, you know, when a question doesn't get answered, it falls into a category of, of questions that have been lingering for uh, X amount of time such that nobody has answered them and they're all piled there together in one place. Um, in addition to whatever other place they may be tagged with, they're tagged with that additional tag. This one I tag with power factor correction. So you can go to power factor correction tag category and you'll find my question, question somewhere in there. Because um, I thought that's the only salient um, topic really that has to do with my topic that I could easily find a tag for. Um, I think that's everything I need to say. So I'm giving away the knowledge for free now because nobody's buying my books, you know. It was good that some of you bought it, gave me some money, but I'm more interested in distribution than anything else. So um, I'm g giving it away for free. What the hey, you know. So uh, on my website, um, I have a an embed, an embedded uh, copy of the PDF version, which is not my favorite. I prefer EPUB because it gives... I'm a, I'm a, I took advantage of the EPUB uh, flexibility in that it allows me to embed audio files in the book, in the ebook, that you can then play. You, can, uh, you have controls and you can control the audio. I haven't tried putting video in, or I think I have and it didn't work, but the audio works. It took hold. Uh, so long as the audio file is not inside the book itself, that it has to go get it and I put it on my website. But the controls I can put on the on the on the book's pages, and you can c uh, play an audio file from the from within the book itself, even though the the audio file itself is not inside the book. But um, <laughs> in order to give it away for free on scribed.com, I had to use a PDF version. So I basically make three versions of my book. I always make a Mobi version, an EPUB, and a PDF. And uh, EPUB is my favorite. Mobi is when I upload it to Amazon. They require either Mobi or their own, and I just I don't bother trying to figure out their own format file format. I just convert it into Mobi, and that's good enough. It works out just fine. But that means you lose some of the options, some of the features that EPUB uh, gives you for reading a book. 
So I prefer EPUB, but to give it away for free on scribed.com, I convert it into PDF. Um, but I still sell it on Amazon and Payhip, um, an elevated, slightly elevated cost on Amazon because they give me better distribution. But it's not selling very well, you know. <laughs> it's the way it is. <laughs> so I'm desperate <laughs> to satisfy myself, to, to make sure I, I get heard. <laughs> My voice is heard. Um, so I guess that's everything I had to say uh, in this video. I'm enjoying myself. It's giving me a lot of fun and enjoyment asking my question on Stack Exchange because it's a very challenging domain. They're, they really challenge you. They, they really, uh, you, you find out how, how, how well you know your question, how, know, how well you know your material. Uh, they're quite, um, you know, it, th th obviously they, there's some things wrong there, but I think it's intrinsic to the system, so you j I just put up with it. You know, it, it just comes with, with the way things are there. And since I like the benefits, then I put up with the, the uh, nonsense. And when I want relief, I go to Quora. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, you know, alternate, right? Alternate between rest and activity. Alternate between the easy Quora and the more challenging uh, stack exchange. And then life progresses, you know, one foot in front of the other, right foot. It takes two feet to walk, right? <laughs> I'm not saying anything new <laughs> that somebody else uh, wiser than me has not already said before me. So <laughs> I like the alternation between the two opposites. Must be because I'm a Gemini. I don't know. <laughs>